Right, I'm going to make a start. I can see that we're getting there with everybody coming in now, um, hopefully. So, uh, welcome to the Scientist Training Programme induction for 2024. Um, and good morning and congratulations for uh, gaining your place on the programme. Um, my name is Sally Clee and I'm the Education Training Manager here at the National School and I'll be your host uh, for the next two days. So whilst we're waiting uh, for people to come in, you can scan uh, today's agenda um, using that QR code there. You have been sent a link uh, to it um, via email. Um, along with the link to join us today. But that will give you an overview of um, this morning and early afternoon. And what speakers we have um, also, and you'll see that there is a break there, which you'll be pleased to hear. So. Sounds like the majority of the. Uh, People coming in are in. Still got some coming. Okay. So the purpose of uh, today's induction, uh, well, the two day induction rather, is two half days. Um, and the main, the overall aim of it really is to inspire you through providing you with the, these opportunities. So the opportunities to gain insight um, into the programme from the training programme directors, current trainees and alumni, so past trainees. Um, also, it will provide you with the opportunity to network with your fellow trainees that are sort of are also starting in September, uh, according to your specialty, which we'll be doing today. And it will give you an opportunity tomorrow to actually network with um, the trainee networks, so the regional ones, professional bodies and your university, so your HEI. So the structure then, just as a reminder, you have got this um, on the agenda in more detail. But today it's about becoming um, a healthcare scientist. So we'll have an introduction to the programme. We've got a panel of inspirational alumni that gives you an opportunity um, to ask them questions about their career journey. And also it gives you the opportunity to network in your specialisms and you should have received the link to the meeting room for your specialism via email yesterday. So if you haven't seen that, then just check your emails um, and just check your junk just in case it's gone into um, your junk folder. If you can't find this, though, um, or didn't receive it, I will put um, the link to our web page in the chat, which has all the links uh, listed. And then you'll be able to find your specialism for yourself on there. Um, and because some specialisms are much larger than others, such as cardiac science, as an example, they've been split into some regions as well, just to make it um, more manageable for yourselves. Day two, um, you'll be looking at managing your programme, so workload management, what it's like, uh, what's expected of you in the first two weeks. Um, but also you'll get a chance to um, ask current trainees. Um, so there'll be a panel of um, trainees that are currently on the programme. You'll get a chance to ask them questions. And then there'll be the networking with HEIs, professional bodies and regional trainee networks. And then part of the structure is the post induction webinars. And so we've got webinar um, there starting next week and I'll be sending you the link site to these um, at the end of tomorrow's session. And there'll be uh, next week it'll be webinar one, 
um, about understanding your work based assessments. Webinar two will be getting to know your ePortfolio. And the following week will be about progression and then we'll have a Q&A session as well. So let me just double check how we're getting on here. We've still got. OK, OK, so those of you just joining us, all of this is on. Um, on the agenda, which you can find um, in the link to in your emails. Um, OK. So we're going to be using Slido today for Q&A. Um, and you can either scan the QR code there to join on your mobile device or you can go to slido.com um, and put in the event code there, which is STP24-1. OK. So I'll leave that up for a second. But every time we use the Q&A and we use Slido, I will have this up on screen so that you can um, access it if you don't get a chance to do that now. Before we start um, and pass over to our first speaker, I just wanted to mention something around the training standards and responsibilities. You were sent a link for this as part of your last email that I contacted you with yesterday. Um, this is something that's really important for you to access. It didn't have to be for today, um, but in preparation for your training, it's really, really important that at least in the next few weeks, you familiarise yourself with the training standards and responsibilities. And you will be reminded of these um, throughout um, the webinars that we've got coming up. If you, uh, I will send you the link. Well, you've had the link to it in an email, but I'll reiterate that link in any follow up emails that I send. But if you follow that link to those training standards and responsibilities, which we've got here, um, it will. You can navigate from these um, to all all the responsibilities that you have in relation to your training. So it's a really important part of the website for you to access. So anything around assessment will be uh, navigated to from those standards. Anything around progression and um, feedback will be navigated uh, from there. Uh, same with support, uh, you uh, the support available to you and EDNI as well. So you can scan that now to have a quick look if you want to. Um, I will show you very briefly um, how that looks um, here. So it tells you a bit about them here. So these are the training standards that we expect your trainer to fulfil, but you have responsibilities against those standards as well. And these are articulated clearly on our website here. So you click on the first training standard, which is plan, design and assess learning and training opportunities, and it will take you uh, straight to what your responsibilities are in relation to that. OK, and what resources are available on our website? And we have Learning Hub resources as well to support you. So to sign up for the NHS Learning Hub, it does explain it there how to do that. Back at the main uh, part, it will tell you how to sign up to the NHS Learning Hub. So we we encourage you strongly uh, to do that. OK. So what we'll do um, before we pass on to Jane, because people are still coming in, just very briefly. Um, I have. A, uh, just a poll to capture. How are you feeling? It'll open, but I can open that now. So, 
our first poll just to check that you can get in is what emoji best describes how you are feeling about today? <laughs> Okay. It's got lots of I like the party one. <laughs> I wish I could uh I feel a bit more like the anxious one at the moment, but I'll be all right. I'll be fine. <laughs> okay, I'll let those keep coming in. So I've the pings have stopped, I hear. Or don't hear as the case may be. So what I will do is I'll keep that one open because it's uh, it's good for those to keep coming through just to make sure that you can access it. Um, like I said, when we come to use Slido for any Q and A, this will um, this uh, QR code and the login details will be uh, the joining details will be shared. So don't worry about that if you didn't quite manage to access that. OK, so we are now going to go over to Jane. So Jane, did you want me to keep sharing? Uh, yes, please, Sally, if that's all right. That's fine. I will switch myself off. OK, so um, morning, everybody. My name is Jane Lynch. I'm one of the STP training programme directors and I've been with the school for a little bit over five years now. Um, next slide, please, Sally. And as Sally said, the first thing I want to say to you all is congratulations and um, welcome to the wonderful world of healthcare science. For those of you in, who are completely new to this, some of you will already have a background in healthcare science, um, but that's a, a wonderful. Um, it's great to have you all here today. And I think this is the largest cohort we've had for the STP. Uh, we're well over 500 this year, so it's great to see so many people here today. Next slide, please. So for those that aren't um, aware too much of what um, the healthcare science workforce makes up, um, we have some statistics here that we quote at a lot of these meetings. So there's around 60,000 healthcare science staff working in the NHS across 50 different specialties, which is around about 5% of the workforce. And um, they help to prevent, diagnose and treat illness using their knowledge of science. Most people work in the acute sector with more than 90% working in diagnostics. And healthcare science staff affect most patient pathways and inform more than 80% of all clinical decisions in primary, secondary and tertiary care. So we've got a big impact um, for quite a small proportion of the NHS workforce. But healthcare science um, hasn't really been as well known as some of the other roles that um, are working within the NHS. Um, so uh, most people, when their children have heard of doctors, they've heard of nurses, they might have heard of radiographers, but they often haven't heard too much about healthcare scientists. That's beginning to change a little bit. And certainly through the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of coverage um, of healthcare science. And if you just go on to the next slide, please, Sally, it's got more detail on that one. So during um, COVID-19, there was a lot of um, activity by healthcare scientists and a lot of um, recognition for the work that they did. Certainly, there was a huge amount of work done um, developing and delivering the testing for um, COVID-19. Ventilator challenge was another big thing where some of our clinical engineers were involved in sourcing enough um, equipment to work in the ICUs to make sure that people got the treatment they needed. A lot of our um, trainees and a lot of um, qualified healthcare scientists were relocated and redeployed during um, the pandemic. Um, particularly within um, the ICU, we had a lot of our respiratory, cardiac and critical care scientists who were um, providing a huge um, role in, in treating people with the massive expansion that we had in ICU. So there's redeployment all over the place. There was a lot of people working in different areas, um, which helped to improve the MDT, the multidisciplinary team working that went on in hospitals. Um, it, it allowed um, a lot of our healthcare scientists to showcase what they could do um, and really just to network more, to become more embedded in a lot of um, uh, disciplines and a lot of um, areas of work that they hadn't worked in before. So this Whilst COVID-19 was a very difficult time for people, there was always benefits to something like that. And 
we saw a lot of our healthcare science staff really stepping up to the mark there. And also in the recovery post pandemic, there's been a, a big backlog of diagnostic testing, which um, has, has um, is still an ongoing uh, issue. And we've got a lot of waiting lists. We've got a lot of people working really hard to, um, to improve services, to change the way we do things, and to really make sure that our patients get the best from the healthcare science staff. Next slide, please. So one of the things that um, is really exciting about healthcare at the moment is the way that we're changing the way we treat people. So the traditional model of healthcare science is that a patient will present with certain symptoms and they'll be diagnosed with a, a particular illness. There are then therapies that are, um, are tested on people and um, approved by NICE to give to patients that have those particular illnesses. However, because everybody's a bit different, that therapy doesn't necessarily work perfectly on everybody. So there'll be a big group of people who will have the desired effect and they will be either uh, cured or their health will become much better with that therapy. But for some people, there'll be no effect at all. The treatment just won't work on them. And we don't always know why that is. Um, and then there's also people that might have an adverse effect. So an example of this might be somebody who is allergic to antibiotics. So whilst the antibiotics work perfectly for some people and cure their illness with other people, it will actually give them more problems. So we want to understand a bit more about why this is happening. And we can do that with more personalised diagnostics. So when people come in and they've got those symptoms, they're diagnosed with a particular illness, we can do a lot more investigations now. We can understand a lot more about what's going on at an individual level. Um, we can do more blood tests. We can look at the DNA of somebody. We can do lots of analysis of the tissues. And that way we can target the therapy um, more effectively. We can give different people different types of therapy. So hopefully that the effect on everybody will be um, optimised. Next slide, please. So some of those things that we can now do that um, weren't always possible in the past, uh, we can collect data over time um, of a series of uh, investigations that we will um, uh, uh, do for people. So we can look at biomedical and biomarker data. We can now um, sequence the genomic data of people and that helps us to understand a lot more about why people become ill um, and how the um, treatments that we give them will affect them. We can do something called multi-omics information, and this is looking at information at a cellular level. So we can look at the metabolomics and the epigenetics of people, and that helps us to understand um, not just what the DNA of somebody is, but how that will work dependent on what's going on at a cellular level within their body. We can look at economic, social and population data. We've got a much bigger range of imaging nowadays, much more physiological tests. We can do tests on tissue samples and many other clinical measurements. And we can collect those now digitally and we can store them over time and we can do a lot more to process those. Next slide, please. So we have um, a huge expansion in um, digital health. So with all the technology that's coming along now, we can do so much more than we used to be able to. When I first started working in healthcare science, uh, we had paper records. They were always getting lost. You didn't read all the bits before it. So there was a huge amount of data within those um, uh, records that perhaps wasn't used and wasn't collected as well as it could be. We can now digitalize those records and that allows us to look at um, the change in things over time. So um, with our diagnostics, I can. I, my background's in cardiac science. I used to do echocardiography, um, and we can look at um, how those different measurements that we make within the echo change over time, and we can plot a graph to see what's happening. Uh, we can do that for um, groups of people as well as individuals. So we can do a lot more with that information that we've got because we can manipulate it better within the digital records. We can also use things like AI and uh, machine learning, and that can help us to do um, things like modeling of things. We can, um, we, we, we're, we're, it's just really at the um, tip of the iceberg with um, AI. It's not something we really feel comfortable about yet, but it's certainly giving us a lot of ways to think about things differently and to look at how we can process that data. We can also integrate the knowledge much better, again, with um, AI and machine learning. We can do that. Um, it can give us things like decision aids. So we can put all um, the information that we have into a, a program and then we can um, get it to create a series of questions, which will allow us to, um, to, to stratify what we're doing and to understand 
exactly how we can um, record the information better, get all the information, put it into a, uh, some kind of um, formula that will give us uh, a help to our decisions. Uh, lots of predictive anal analytics in there as well. We can um, do a lot more outside of um, the hospitals as well now. So a lot of people have got personal health devices. So things like blood sugar monitors that people can wear so that they know what their blood sugar is doing all the time and they don't get um, uh, spikes and lows as much because they're, they're alerted to problems long before they would be if we were just taking a blood sample of them at certain times of the day. So that allows us to um, be much more um, proactive in monitoring our, our own health. Telemedicine is another big one that we've got. This certainly came um, out good during COVID when we had to um, stop, well, have reduced the number of people coming into hospitals. So we did a lot more with um, telemedicine so we can now monitor people in their own homes. We can um, do this over the internet. We can do that with new types of um, machines that will talk to um, the hospital. And it allows us to do a lot more with patients in their own home. Diagnostics are changing a lot. Um, there's a lot of new stuff that's coming out. That's allowing us to do a lot of our diagnostics and outside of the hospital. So one of the things that's happening at the moment is the creation of um, community diagnostic centres. So a lot of um, a lot of the problems with um, diagnostics in the past used to be that the uh, information from them wasn't always transferable to the hospital. That's changing. So we're now um, making sure that the diagnostics can talk to each other and um, any information can be passed from one site to another so that we've all got all the information at the right time. Imaging is changing. So there's a, a huge amount of um, development ongoing all the time in imaging machines, new MRI scanners and um, PET scanners, all these kind of things are much, much more efficient and much more effective than they used to be. Um, we can also now put things together. So when I was working in the hospital, we used to have a CT of a patient's heart um, that was created before the operation and we could overlay that with um, an image of an ultrasound of the heart that was live at the same time and that helps um, during operations for people to know exactly what they're supposed to be doing because they can see not only what the structure is but they can see the function at the time. Pharmaceuticals are changing as well so um, understanding of the body means that we can understand the pharmaceutical need much better and we can make sure that doses are more titrated um, and we can as I said with the blood sugar thing we can make sure that people are getting up at the right time. Implantable devices are also becoming much more user friendly. They tend to get smaller, so um, we can now implant um, cardiac monitors into people's chests that stay there for months or even years, and they can um, record what's going on with the heart so that we can get a really good understanding of what's happening there. Surgical is changing as well. We're starting to use um, robotic things, so somebody can be actually in a different um, room or in a different hospital or even in a different country and they can control a robot in another room. Sounds really scary to me but that's one of the things that's happening and it's becoming really really um, uh, accurate these days. We can also do things like 3D printing um, so um, we can now create models of things like the heart or any other organ so that we can see what's going on there. We can 3D print all sorts of things these days. Um, ge genetic based tailoring is another big thing. So once we understand uh, pe a person's genomics, we can see where there are um, genes that are slightly faulty and then we can understand what's going to happen to them and we can understand what we need to do to treat them. And things like geospatial and environmental things as well. So we now can have much more understanding of what's going on in a person, um, perhaps outside of the hospital. So we can um, put exposure monitors on them to see maybe how their asthma uh, fares if they're in an area that's got a lot of um, pollution. And we can understand that much more better and more um, easily now and we can track it and we can put it into their digital health um, records these days. Next slide, please. So healthcare scientists are all involved in all of the things that I've been talking about there. And um, to become a healthcare scientist, to become a clinical scientist, you need to understand, um, obviously, what's happening. You need to be part of a training programme. You need to understand what you need to do and uh, the theory behind this and how things are changing. So all of you have come along today, really excited, I hope. Um, from Sally's emojis, it looked like a lot of the, you were really happy to be here. So that's great. 
Um, and one of the things that we always mention to our trainees here is that when you come along here, you've got a plan yeah, at the start of your journey here. It's a nice, smooth course. You're going to be fine all the way through it and you're going to hit the, the end point, which is, um, you know, qualifying so that you can become a, a registered um, clinical scientist and then go further in your career. Um, do you want to just move on, Sally? But reality might not be quite like that. Um, we always expect there to be a few bumps in the journey. So not everybody's going to be the same, but some people will have a reasonably smooth journey. Some people have a, a few more bumps in there. And that's not not unexpected. You know, three years is a long time. Um, a lot of things will happen in your life that you have no control over. You will find that there are times when things are more difficult. You'll find that there are times when you get a helping hand to go, to move further on in your um, training program. So when you hit these bumps, don't be try not to be too worried by it. Um, it's something that most of our trainees are going to face. We can help you with them. Your um, colleagues in your workplace can help you with them. And it's all part of the learning journey. At the end of it, you come out much stronger, having been through some challenges and, and some really good times whilst you're on the programme. Next slide, please. So uh, I just mentioned there that the school can help you um, uh, if you hit any of these challenges and the school is, is here and we exist to secure for the NHS excellent and relevant education and training um, for the healthcare science uh, workforce of today and tomorrow. Um, so we're here to support trainees through the programme. We've um, provided you with an induction to the programme. So today and tomorrow, and then there's a number of different webinars that will uh, focus on specific aspects that you can come along to. And I'd really advise that you do make time to come to all of those because they're, they're really important. We also do things like endorsing the training sites and the higher education institutions so that we can make sure that you're in an appropriate environment and you're getting the right um, academic programme and the right workforce training. We provide train the trainer resources so all your training officers will have been through a programme and they will have been um, given a lot of information about how things work. They may not know everything, you may not know everything, so remember that we're here and if you have any questions um, you can either look on the website or you can contact us. We also maintain the curriculum library. So the curriculum has been uh, recently reviewed and you're all on a, a much updated programme now. It's um, uh, been reviewed based on feedback from previous trainees, from training officers, from stakeholders in other parts of healthcare science. But we've listened to all of that information and we've put together a programme that really is fit for the future. Um, we provide an electronic polio, portfolio for workplace training. So as you um, go through the programme, you will be um, completing a number of training activities and a number of assessments. And those need to be evidenced and need to be in your portfolio so that you've got all that there at the end of the, the programme to show that you've done it all. As I said uh, before, we provide training support for trainees on the programme. So um, if you're having problems, we would suggest that the first thing you do is talk to your training officer. Um, or somebody else in your department who you feel comfortable with, um, look on the website. Um, but we are here to help you if you've got something that you can't resolve through those methods. So there's lots of information around that will support you in that. But please come to us if you are still struggling. And we also um, provide a completion service so that when you come to the um, end of the programme, we can make sure that you've ticked off all the aspects of it and that you really are ready to go into practice independently. Next slide, please. So the NHS, NSHCS collaborates with um, a huge amount of people. So we talk to trainees and training officers all the time. We have a lot of interaction between um, ourselves, yourselves and your training officers. Um, we also um, interact with the trainee networks. Hopefully you'll be able to speak to some of them uh, tomorrow. And I would really advise you to join a trainee network, a bit of peer support, at this point in your programme is really important. You'll get a lot out of that. Um, a lot of the trainee networks will put on um, talks, they'll give you information, they'll give you a lot of support and they'll introduce you to other people. So that's really worth doing. We also um, work with shortlisters to ensure that we can recruit to the programme. Um, interviewers who will um, actually do the interview so that you get recruited onto the programme. And we work with assessors who will um, be present at your final year assessment to make sure that um, you are ready to go back and in, going out into the workforce. 
We work with the Higher Education Institute, so we have a number of different universities that we work closely with so that we make sure that um, we know what's going on, they know what's going on and everything's working properly. We work with the Academy for Healthcare Science as well. Um, they, um, they used to be our education provider. We've now um, taken on that role, um, but they work very closely with us, helping to ensure that everything's running smoothly, registration's going well, the standards of proficiency are uh, updated, and, and we all um, can ensure that healthcare science education is going correctly. And we work with the professional bodies in the Royal Colleges as well to make sure that we're looking at um, a bit more rounded um, ways so that we know that as you leave the um, the training programme and uh, become part of professional bodies in Royal Colleges, that you're doing all doing the right things and we're all training to the appropriate level. Next slide, please. So I think this might be my last slide, but really this is just um, to give you a few hints, um, top tips for success on the STP. So the first thing we say is be collaborative. Um, you're not here just to do something on your own. You're part of a big training scheme. There's loads of other trainees on that. In your workplace, you will also be working very closely with colleagues, um, training officers, other colleagues, and maybe other STPs on there. Be collaborative, work together, try and make get the most out of that team working. Make sure you get to know your training officer. They're really important on this programme and they can help you. They can support you massively. So make sure you, you really get to know them. Network with other trainees and STP alumni. That Again, that's another um, really good benefit for you. You'll get a lot of um, support from the other trainees and STP alumni who've been through the programme will be really useful. Within your uh, trust, there should be a lead scientist and possibly an educational lead as well. So I would um, seek them out, try and find out who they are, and if possible, introduce yourself to them. You can contact the university for ideas, help and support. They will have their own support policies as well. So you, you can use those for um, anything if you need them. Be prepared to be a pioneer. Sometimes you'll be going out there and you'll be asking and trying to learn new things from people that haven't met an STP before. So you need to be able to explain who you are and, and uh, be motivated and go out there and try and talk to people. Tell others what you do. Spread the word of what a healthcare science is and what you're doing on the programme. And embrace the journey. Three years is a long time. It will go fast, but you'll you'll pack in a huge amount of learning um, and change within that time. So really try and enjoy it as much as you can. That it, Sally, is that last one? Yes. Okay, That's thanks it. Very much. Thank, thank you so much, Jane. That's brilliant. Now we're going to be joined by Anthony Kavindi and uh, Ryan. Um, I'm just looking for, I can't see. Let me just... Who are we missing? Emily. Is Emily there? And there are inspirational alumni. So if you're, oh, there you are, Emily. Thank you for putting your, yeah, for some reason. Oh, no. Let me allow it. Oh, I think someone's done it for me. That's fine. Sorry, Emily. So if our inspirational alumni can please uh, open their cameras and mics, that would be great so we can see who you are. You might have already and I just can't see it because I've got so many people, uh, so many screens at the moment because there's so many people in. So if we go over then, so the structure for this then is we've got four um, panel members. Um, so what I would like to do, first of all, is for you to introduce yourselves and tell us um, a bit about so a bit about you. So what your specialism is specifically and a bit about your career journey so far. So shall we start with um, Emily? Hi, um, so I'm Emily Alderson. I'm a clinical vascular scientist at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. Um, so I first started off by studying human biology at Loughborough University. Um, and then I went straight on to do the STP after my undergrad, um, obviously specialising in vascular science. I got placed at Addenbrooke's, uh, which is obviously where I still am now. And I finished the STP last September. 
Uh, whilst I was doing my SDP, I did a project to try and improve the service, um, the wider vascular service at my trust um, and help meet um, national guidelines and things. Um, obviously, at the end of the SDP, I've got a permanent job here at Addenbrooke, so I have stayed on at my training location, which is not what everybody does. Um, not everyone has that opportunity or some people choose not to. And then since finishing the SDP, I've taken on a lot of additional roles within my department. Um, so, for example, um, being the training officer for visiting STPs, or I developed an um, anonymous feedback system to help personal development within my department, um, written standard operating procedures, perform local audits. So post SDP, there's a lot of opportunities out there if you do take them. It's brilliant. Thank you, Emily. And Kavindi? Yes, so I'm Kavindi. Um, I'm a clinical scientist in uh, clinical immunology, as you can see. Um, I, my story is very similar. My career journey is very similar to Emily's. So I did uh, my undergraduate yeah, at UCL um, in biomedical sciences. It was a very academic degree, which I didn't like. Um, I wanted to do more healthcare facing roles. Um, so I got into I got into the SDP um, straight after university. Um, immunology, because a lot of my undergrad was focused on immunology, especially my research projects. So that that's what got my interest. Um, so yes, I did my STP in Plymouth and um, similar to Emily, I got my clinical scientist post here as well. Um, and also similarly, I'm heavily involved in training. So for visiting STPs, we've, we're having ST, we're having an STP this year, um, who's probably on this call. Um, and yeah, I can't think of anything else to add to that. That's fantastic. Thank you, Kavindi. And then if we go to Ryan, Hi, I'm Ryan. Uh, so yeah, I work in imaging or medical physics, specifically MRI. So my full job title is clinical science in magnetic resonance. Uh, I going into the STP, I always knew I was going to pick non-ionizing. I always knew I was going to pick MRI. Reason being is because I have a huge interest in uh, muscles, uh, soft tissue imaging, MSK imaging, basically, or well, muscles and like dynamic muscle dynamics in general. So I actually wanted to do clinical engineering, uh, not medical physics, but I ended up in medical physics. Um, I did an undergrad in biomedical engineering at King's. I then did a uh, master's in robotics at Imperial. So that was my focus was thinking towards uh, robotic, robotic prosthetics. Uh, but then I kind of shifted my plans when I got uh, medical physics and went towards the sports kind of sports imaging, sports uh, therapy area. So that's why I always knew I was going to pick uh, MRI and ultrasound because those are the gold standards, gold standard imaging methods for uh, soft tissue imaging. So, yeah, three years later, uh, after joining the STP, I graduated last September, as uh, Emily said as well. Uh, I trained at uh guys in St Thomas that's where I'm based now as well Well, I trained at uh, King's College Hospital actually but South London hospitals are quite closely knit so we kind of got passed around so I was mostly at guys in St Thomas so I'm there now in a band seven post at guys in St Thomas I've uh, been there for a year last Wednesday now um yeah it's pretty good uh, I'm involved in quite a few things we're quite a big team big team for MRI physics generally there are only four or five people Ours is about 20, so we are quite a big team. But it's nice because everyone has different uh, areas of expertise, so there's a lot to get involved in. Um, yeah, that's all I can think of right now. That's great. Thank you, Ryan. And finally, last but not least, Anthony. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, my name is Anthony. Um, so, yes, I'm also a graduate of the STP programme. Uh, my specialism was cardiac science and to give you a quick background about myself um, I found out about the STP when I was in my second year of university I was studying sport and exercise science at Hertfordshire University um, at that point I didn't know what specialism within the field of um, healthcare I wanted to pursue but I, I knew at that point that I wanted to make the transition um, so I then sought to take a placement year to help me answer that question, um, to which I spent a year working in the NHS. My first experience working in the NHS in the cardiac department, 
at uh, Queen's Hospital, which is the community hospital of St. George's NHS Trust. Um, from there, when I finished my placement, I then finished my final year of university, which was my fourth year. Um, and that same summer, I joined St. Bart's as a cardiographer, so performing ECGs. Um, within a year, I applied as an internal applicant to the STP uh, program through my employer, which was Bart's, and I was uh, successful. Um, so yeah, my time on the STP was really good, very rewarding. As you all know, it's a very tough um, program to get onto. So I really tried to make the most of the opportunities that I had and said yes more times than I, than I said no, um, to the extent where I created a peer-to-peer -peer, um, student platform called the STP Buddies uh, during my studies to showcase what STP students go through day to day, as well as sign, sign posting opportunities um, that other students may be interested in. Um, I would say the highlight of my STP program was when I took my elective to Sri Lanka um, and I experienced healthcare system there for two weeks and it was a really eye-opening experience. So thank you. That's brilliant, Anthony. Thank you. And thank to all four, four of you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go over to Slido to um, capture your questions. And while we're waiting for that, I have got a couple of starter questions uh, for our panel. So uh, my first one um, and um, you can just, you know, you can volunteer to answer. What can I get involved with now as a trainee to support my career post training? Sorry, <clears throat> losing my voice there already. So who would like to answer that one? We've heard um, a little bit from Anthony um, there. Go on with that. Um, I just say that take any opportunity that's available to you whilst you're doing the STP. Um, Obviously, during your training, you're supernumerary, so there's going to be situations where you can observe things at your trust or outside of your trust or go to training days or conferences that you can't necessarily do once you're trained and you're in a full time role and you have responsibility. So take the opportunity now, join your local trainee networks um, and yeah, see as much as you possibly can and <clears throat> excuse me doing that now it's not only about increasing your knowledge in your field it's also about networking because at the end of your STP you don't know where you're going to end up in terms of a job so if you've been to conferences or national events or whatever you'll have met people in your specialism from around the country and that ultimately could be invaluable um, for your career going forwards. It's brilliant thank you Emily and um, Ryan you've got your hand up yeah just to add to that i completely agree with what emily said um and just to give some examples so i was a big proponent of going to places where i didn't need to be kind of thing um because i was supernumerary you know so i went to our office was opposite the physiotherapy uh department and like i said before i have a big interest in uh, like you know sports imaging and like kind of physio and fitness so i went into the department and i said oh can i can i observe it and you know it wasn't anything really to do with MRI, but because I wanted to, I just made the kind of connections and they let me do it. So I just went there for two days and I got to observe it. Uh, even my MSc project for the STP, I did it in the gay lab, not in. So it wasn't MRI really MRI related at all. It was I because I've studied at King's and GSTT has a lot of close ties with King's. I knew the uh, lecturer that did work in the gate lab and I just went down and asked. And even if I didn't, you know, I could have figured out who he was. And so, you know, it is just me saying definitely just push out of your comfort zone and go do things, talk to people you wouldn't normally, because you can get a lot out of, you know, just making a connection. And then, you know, further down the line, you might need that. So definitely. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, just um, to... Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, just to add to what you've both said, exactly, I would say networking. Um, you, you don't know when you're going to need people and when you're going to come across the same people again. And 
you know, have an opportunity that you never realised was available to you because you've spoken to someone before. Um, but just to add to the joining training networks part of it, so I wish I joined um, my training network, so the regional STP training work network in my first year and got a little bit more involved. Um, I wanted to get involved at the start of my third year and I sort of accidentally found myself as the joint network lead. Um, I don't regret doing that. It was a lot of, it was a quite a high workload in my third year because I've I had all of my other commitments but I did I don't regret doing that because it, it exposes you to challenges even just people dealing with people um, organizing training teamwork leadership things that you will need in your post STP life so I'd say as soon as you can even if you feel like first year is too early um, get involved even just start to learn what your network does and then maybe in your second year you can become more involved as part of the board um, of organisers. Thank you, Kavindi. That's great. So and my my final question is, what did you find most challenging about the STP? That's a big question. <laughs> Anyone want to volunteer that one? I don't mind starting again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's the balance between academic and clinical work for well clinical work for myself obviously some specialisms aren't necessarily clinical but it's the work-based training and the academic work because it it's competing all the time um, and I think to balance that it you have to be very organized you have to communicate well with your line manager your training officer your colleagues make them aware of what university studies or deadlines you have so that they can manage your work-based training knowing that and around that um, but yeah, it, it's hard, but you, it's possible if you're organised would be my advice. <laughs> oh, thank you, Emily. I would say... Yeah. Ryan, yeah, sorry, uh, Ryan. Say, uh, <laughs> the, the STP is such a national programme, you're not going to have the same experience in any site you train at or every site you train at rather so for me it was kind of like the, the lack of standardization between different hospitals you know you kind of have to adapt quite quickly to the way in different departments work so obviously on your rotations you'll be generally in well for me at least they're in different different sites in different hospitals in different teams so I think you know I'm quite a person who craves structure and when there isn't a structure it's it's, it's kind of hard for me to function so I think that was kind of adapting to what other like the other way of working for the, every team I went to that took a bit uh, of learning but eventually I got used to it that's great thank you Ryan um and what we'll do then now we'll go over to the Q&A so let me just share that so we've got quite a few questions um coming in oh apart from I've got a connection lost which is always the way. Let's see. Sorry about this. Okay, let me just turn that off and show the Q&A. So if we start, um, so we've got a question here about the elective, because obviously I knew as soon as you'd mentioned it, Anthony, that would, uh, develop an interest I will just put a little caveat before you um, answer that um, it was slightly different because it's a new curriculum uh, that our trainees are on and there's not an elective as such there's a professional development module um, where you know there is a capacity to do that um, but that's between um, individuals and their actual employer um, so I will just put that little caveat in there that it's not something that everybody will necessarily have the opportunity to do to go to a different country. But I will pass over um, to Anthony to answer that question. So how do you arrange that? How did you arrange that elective in Sri Lanka? Um, uh, at first, I just want to reiterate, uh, it's very important what, what you said, Sally. Um, <laughs> Before I attempted to arrange anything, um, it's very important to look at what, in my case, the elective meant and whether it was mandatory um, for my year group or not. Um, and at that point, I believe after COVID, it wasn't m a mandatory. 
Um, but I sought to do it anyway uh, for my own professional development. So I would say the first thing is have a look at the curriculum, um, become familiar with it and have a conversation with your employer, even about your ideas. And um, from there, a lot of things can come out. For example, they could suggest um, local first opportunities uh, before, you know, running to your training lead with a, a big grand plan. Um, yeah, so for my personal experience, um, I looked at many different uh, companies and countries. Um, long story short, I found a company online or charity, should I say, called The Mighty Raw. Um, you can just Google them or find them on social media. They have a quiet decent social media presence. Um, my aim was, first of all, to have a safe and guided clinical experience abroad, um, to um, have a experience of a new culture. And again, back to my first uh, point about what you had to get out of it, I had to present my, my findings in comparing the Sri Lankan um, healthcare system to the NHS. Um, so again, going back to my um, example, I brought all of this to my training um, uh, officer, sat down with him, I, I produced the A4 document, so it was pretty clear, this is what my intentions, this is the time I wanted to go. Um, and the conversations were very beneficial that way because everybody understood from um, an annual leave perspective, okay, I will take a study leave, um, they knew what times I was going, um, etc. So I would say, you know, there's a more detailed explanation and I believe on the STB Buddies YouTube and Instagram, I created maybe a 50 minute video going into more detail. Um, so any other questions, you can probably um, refer to that um, or get in contact uh, with me directly. Thank you, Anthony. That's great. So our next question, next popular question, how to keep everything nine to five and not work after hours uh, from the uni pressure? So that's a good question. Who would like to answer that? I can take this one. Okay, um, I'll start with this one. I would say it is very difficult. Um, you have lots of competing, uh, lots of things competing for your attention. And sometimes the attention focuses more on one thing as a, uh, more than the other. I would say the main thing is, and I think everybody who does the SDP wants to do the SDP is quite ambitious. They're quite, you know, they're quite high achievers. They want to be the best that they can and learn everything to the you know the depth that they want to learn but i think accepting that you can't do that in every area you can't you can't learn everything to the depth that you would want to um the time for learning things for to that level will be post stp and in your further further development as a clinical scientist um just accept that good enough is good enough you, you, you know there has to be a limit to what you can achieve even with your masters really there is no need to get a distinction everybody at the end of the day I will say all I cared about was getting my HCPC registration so it's just making sure all the work you do is good enough and make sure you get it done and not spend too much time um, doing it but I will say I personally found this very difficult and I, I don't think I was able to keep to that nine to five um, but yeah I don't know what other people think. Thank you Kavindi. I'll just add to say that I think it is very difficult to stay within nine to five. Obviously, use your study days to the best of your advantage. Like, don't waste your study days because that's time you're being given to try and help you not have to work outside of work. And it's kind of like peaks and troughs um, around your exams. You're probably going to find you are working a lot outside of working hours. I'm not saying that's necessarily right, but it it's what depends what you want to get from it. And if you want to do really really well the time is not there because you're working um but then there's times when you don't have deadlines and exams that you won't be working very much outside of your designated study day 
Um, so I think having that expectation that you probably are going to have to do some outside of work, but also that um, you can be effective in the time you're given to reduce that amount. Oh, sorry, I think your mic's muted. Sorry, thank you, Emily. Schoolgirl error that was. If you had to do it again, what would you change or prioritise in your approach? I mean, I can take this one. Um, oh, brilliant. Thank you, Brian. Answer as well. I kind of would do the same thing. I don't know. Um, I think just, just probably like highlight just I think the first point that we all spoke about just about making the most of it I think this is the one time you are going to be super numerate. you know you're not if if you don't show up one day well you know at least in my experience if you don't show up one day to the office no one's going to be like oh where are you like you need to do this clinical work it's you know you're there to absorb especially I think now with a new curriculum as well it's very much focused on you absorbing and you shadowing and you learning as much as you can and I think you know uh, one thing is don't get bogged down by the competencies you know um especially well, when i when i think all of us probably did it it was quite competencies were a bit more task focused and they were you know do these things do these things nowadays it seems to be a bit more shadow this reflect on this um and i think just remember that uh, it's not just the stv is not just about completing your competencies and ticking boxes it's about getting experience for the job or gaining experience for other stuff outside the job as well that are related to that so i think just prioritizing literally doing as much as you can you know without making it too difficult for yourself as well as what i would say thank you uh ryan that's brilliant um so we've got the next question we've got is what are the post training roles you can get into other than becoming a clinical scientist? That might be a difficult question to answer, or are you, um, that anybody would like to volunteer with that? I would say that is a difficult question given we are all clinical scientists. <laughs> yeah. um, we say. went straight into clinical scientist roles. I do know people who have gone into um, sort of companies so companies that so I work in a lab so uh, companies that manufacture lab uh, products and uh, re reagents and kits and uh, testing equipment that kind of thing um, I think other things that people go into later in their career from a lab point of view is um, EQA um, so external quality assurance bodies um, and uh, UCAS um, so accreditation bodies as well um, those are the things that I've heard of personally Thank you, Kavindi. Just add, I think, you know, you are essentially completing another degree and, you know, getting your registration. This does, obviously, the STP sets you up for being a clinical scientist, so that's kind of the point. But if you do want to divert, um, I think, you know, in a sense, the world's your oyster because you, you've added another qualification to your belt. You can kind of do whatever you want to do in life for the most part, you know what I mean? So you can expand to something related in your field, you know, you could kind of negate the whole... STP, I don't know why you would, but, you know, and go into something that you did, you know, relate to your degree beforehand. It is, you know, you are developing professional qualities and other translational skills, but the, becoming a clinical scientist is the whole point. So you are going to be more set up for that. But then there are loads of other things that you can do. You know, I think like um, Kavitha was saying as well, like, you know, later on, I think after maybe being in a cl clinical science post for a bit, people might tend to go in different places but I think straight away I wouldn't I, I wouldn't imagine that most people divert from going to the clinical science route. Thank you Ryan that's great and um, I think this one's for Anthony can we join or access STP buddies? Um, yeah so currently STP buddies is a kind of free online social community um, that is mainly based across YouTube. So we have a YouTube channel. Um, so I believe the, the last video was the video on the elective I done last year. Um, so YouTube, Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, yeah, so typically at 
I would say on the average week, I just answer people's questions. For example, new starters, etc., may message me on um, either of those platforms, typically LinkedIn or Instagram. And again, um, like I would do for myself, I signpost them to the National School for Healthcare Science website um, because if there is going to be any updates, that's where you're going to find them. <laughs> and I doubt that that has changed irrespective of um, the curriculum updates. So short answer, yes. That's great. Thanks, Anthony. And we, we're going to do something about that, about communicating that more widely anyway, um, are we? So um, we were going to talk about that. So that's fab. Um, how did you organise all the competencies um, or training activities uh, modules throughout the course? Any volunteers? Um, so I think from my perspective, um, organising, so I'm not sure how exactly how the curriculum has changed, so whether you still have wider modules other than your rotational specialisms now, but um, I just got contacts from people in my department who knew of people in other departments in the hospital. I wrote to them, explained what I was doing, why I wanted to come. Um, often used the STP um, National School, sorry, curriculum, and actually sent them what I needed to achieve from that placement, so that I was going sort of best set up with them to show me the things I needed to see. Um, largely, people are happy to accommodate. Um, I think your training officer can help with contacts for your rotations that you have to go on. I think training officers tend to be quite involved often even before you start to communicate with the other departments and set up your rotations that last for a few weeks. But for day placements, it's just a case of emailing, getting contacts, uh, reaching out and trying to find people to to contact. And if they're the wrong person, they'll sign post you to the right person for that placement. Um, so yeah, just don't be afraid to ask basically. It, it's interesting hearing that you had to sort out your own because I think for, for medical physics uh, in South London, it was all sorted. Like we just we just kind of bounced around from place to place by a guided, uh, you know, whatever way we, we had a list of what we were doing throughout that, that those set of rotations. So for me, it was already planned. And in terms of, you know, I guess organising it, like in terms of well, the competency list was there and it was just a case of following that. While you're in your rotation, it is like, you know, are down to you for what to do some some sites will be like this is what i was saying about the lack of uh lack of standardization among sites you know even within south london or within the same hospital a different team will be might be completely different you know some my first rotation was really structured they like gave me loads to do and i was kind of quite autonomous by the end of it whereas some other places were just a bit more you know relaxed and said oh you do, do what you want kind of thing so it, it was just a case of ticking off those and you know having that communication with whoever's supervising you there. That's great. And I am I right in saying that you probably had a training plan in place that was reviewed regularly as well against those different um competencies that you were doing as well. They were planned out. Yeah, so like our supervisors at the departments would kind of check in with you and see where you were that and obviously it depends what type of training you are you know I'm quite I'd say proactive you know I wanted to get everything done before I left so I didn't have any any you know loose ends yeah. I was checking with you and everything just to just to make sure because that, that's the priority really just to make sure that while you've had a good time and saw a lot of things that you've got those competencies done rotationally yeah no, that's great thank you Ryan is it easy to meet other STPs across different specialisms in hospitals? Is there a sort of STP community for each trust? I can answer this one. Um, I think easy is uh, relative and it depends on the hospital that you are at. So in the hospital that I'm at, um, but when, when we started the STP, there were, we knew somehow, I don't know how, but we managed to gather the fact that there were five of us and we had a little Facebook group chat um, and 
myself and a biochemistry STP met up with the others um, for for lunch, but we never met. The others were in medical physics, a completely different specialism to us. Um, we never met them again. <laughs> um, but in our department, the um, all the blood sciences, so the biochemistry, hematology, HNI, immunology, are quite closely linked. All the clinical scientists um, talk to each other quite often. So um, I had the biochemistry STP who. I still sit next to who's now a clinical scientist so it was really useful for me to have that um the only thing i would say for the stp community is try to find out from like i don't know from facebook groups um whatever forums that you might be on what already exists but sometimes it might not exist and don't wait for people to create that for you i would say reach reach out to other people and make that group yourself because it sometimes it's just waiting for someone to make the first move uh, like make the first step and um, to bring people together. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you, Karindi. Anyone want to add anything to that one? Um, I would just say that at my trust, the network of STPs is not as good as other places. We have our regional network, which sometimes organises mm. sorts of events, so you meet people through that, um, but that's not often. Um, you we often meet the other people within physiological sciences because we sort of cross each other on rotations and um, so you can have a bit of a network in that mm -hmm. regard um but this hospital site's very big and I, I mean I don't even know how many other SDPs were in in my year for example um so yeah I think what uh, Kevin said is make that connection if nobody else has try and make that connection yeah that's brilliant. Thank you, Emily. So next one, is there a lot of pressure to get a job straight away after you finish the STP? Could you potentially take a few months off first to travel, etc? I think that pressure is mostly internal, isn't it? So it depends on whether you can afford to take a couple of months of, off work or not. Um, in terms of a, applying for an, a, a clinical scientist post, I can't imagine why if you were doing an application and someone said, what were you doing in this three month employment gap? And you said you were traveling. I can't imagine why anyone would not like that. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's really up to the individual. The one thing I would say about that is just to I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to be like too scary but be be uh, wary of I think the more because you're going to be employed by the NHS if you take certain gaps you lose certain benefits I don't know the full list but I know there's like if you if you have a week more than a week of non-employment you lose it's a very small benefit by uh, maybe it varies by trust as well but um yeah you lose some sort of very small benefit and I think the next one is like I think the next one after that is probably like three months and you lose like some sort of like a I think it's like continuous service or something or there's this point where you lose certain benefits essentially is what i'm saying so just check that you know what those are before you take that leave but in terms of pressure i mean there's not really you know a lot of people took like a week or two or you know maybe not like loads of months to travel off but i know people did take some time just to have a little break but i didn't take any to be fair but it's up to you okay any other comments on that one I think just on the leave thing is um, it's even if you're in employment, but you take annual leave once you finish the STP, I think it is quite a, a good thing to have a week or two off. Um, I think a lot of people are quite tired and then jumping straight into a full time role straight away is not always the best. Obviously, it's an individual thing, but whether that's in employment or whether you have a gap between your service. But yeah, I would recommend that. Um, I just want to second that as well. Um, three years is a long time, is a long space of, of life. And to think that outside of bank holidays, your annual leave um, allowance, you're going to be working and you're going to be studying. Um, this isn't the traditional um, university degree. Um, it's almost a vocational degree. So um, when, you know, people are on breaks you may not necessarily have have, have those breaks um as probably all of us can attest to there are going to be sacrifices that you're going to have to make and once you do pass once you do pass the msc and pass the scp um it may not be time off but find a way to 
celebrate yourself and in the way that is best for you recalibrate yourself because um you know don't just think about the short term of finishing the degree and working straight away have a more holistic view of your career um so you don't experience things such as burnout which can have more um you know bad effects on one's you know mental health or just you know general professional development um so i would say you know speak to your training officer have informal conversations with perhaps stp students um in different years and have these conversations early um so when you do approach the last you know 12 to 6 months you have an idea um and that idea or plan can be implemented into your training plan whether you're going to apply at the um, hospital that you're working in or if you're going to apply elsewhere um, or if you're going to take some time off um, that way these things are planned and um, you don't feel pressure too much pressure that's great thank you Anthony and um, we tomorrow um, as part of the second day um, Joe, one of our TPDs, will be talking through about managing your health and well-being as well during the programme because that's a really important um, aspect to consider. Um, because it is, and it, you know, there's a lot of components to the programme as well to juggle and manage and adapt to as well, which actually leads us to that keeps moving. Uh, but the next two questions, really, so. What would be your top tips for us at the start of this program? So who would like to give a couple of top tips? There can be more than one of you. <laughs> I don't mind starting. Um, so to echo what uh, Anthony was saying about annual leave and stuff, um, except that it, it is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. So you've got to conserve your your energy, your mental health um, for so your annual well-being for, for the three years. Um, similar to what I said before, um, accept good enough as opposed to perfection. Um, networking as well. Um, so at the start of the program, reach out to everybody on the same uh, specialism, on people with adjacent specialism, but even people you think are completely, and might not know, you might think you'll never come across them again, you know, if they're medical physics or something completely uh, different. But I would say, um, reach out to as many different people as you can. There'll be STPs in the year above you, in your hospital, in hospitals, in, um, in nearby hospitals, but even regionally, um, ask someone if they can be your mentor. Let's say you have a second year who's in a different hospital um, and your own training officer might be quite busy. Um, so if a fellow STP would be able to help you better. Um, yeah, I, that's all I can think of at the top of my head. That's great, Kavindi, thank you. Emily? I think firstly is just to be open-minded like we sort of started off saying um, in the questions you asked Sally is take all the opportunities you can and that's only going to benefit you both with your results and the way you perform on the STP but both that and after the STP. Um, I think communicate well with your training officer and line manager if you are feeling overwhelmed or having any problems or struggling, you need to tell them because they're not they're not going to know they've got their own job that they do as well as being your training officer. They're not constantly watching for signs. Um, so, yeah, communicate with them and um, just on the annual leave perspective, I think some of the people on my year used to use annual leave to study and I would advise not doing this. Um, you do need a break from studying and from work. Um, ultimately you, you'll end up burnt out if you don't give yourself that break. So be strict that your annual leave is annual leave. Um, but ultimately just enjoy it um, you get some amazing experiences um, and it is, it is good fun, although it's hard work. So yeah, enjoy it. Just quickly to add, like Amidia was saying, I think sometimes good enough is you know, good enough. Like it's, you don't have to strive for perfection. And I think so a lot of the time you're probably not going to reach perfection. And I think it's good to maintain the big picture idea of what, why you're needs to be and what you're doing. Don't get bogged down with, oh, I need to do this because this competency says this. And I think the new curriculum probably encompasses that a bit better than how it used to be. So just remember what you're training for and that, you know, you want to get as much experience as you can. 
not the individual little competencies. So just, yeah, maintain that big picture. I would just like to add quickly to what I said before about accessing support, because it's something I wish I knew at the start of my STP, but don't just look to one or two places for support. Ask everybody around you, fellow STPs on different disciplines, people who might not even be know anything about STPs, don't suffer in silence, so to speak. You might think if this sounds really um, sounds like I'm putting a, putting a downer on things, but you will face challenges during the STP um, and you might feel like you're not getting the support you need in one area. Just make sure you reach out, um, talk to fellow STPs. Someone else is probably going through the same thing. So you, I can guarantee you will not be the only person facing the challenges that you are facing. So make sure you don't suffer in silence, basically. Thank you, Kavindi. And I think, Anthony, were you going to um, add to um, that? That's great. Yeah, I, was, I would initially I was going to say, you know, ask questions and, um, you know, give it your all. But I'm aware I would assume that a lot of people are already going to do that. Um, so just to rein home what has been said um, is very important for you to speak up when things in life happen and just to break that down um in the next three years um from my i'll give my own experience i had family members that that passed away or that were unwell and I had to take off you know leave for for funerals i had my own kind of kind of down times in with regards to my own men, mental health um but I will say I, I received help in the ways that I needed because I did speak up um, and my first kind of person to speak to was my training officer um, who was a, able to first understand what I was going through and make adjustments. Um, so swap days that I had, for example, study leave or um, give me an afternoon where I could be away from a clinical area or even have time to have more catch ups than we would compared to other times. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important to speak because um, this isn't, you know, secondary school, this isn't college. Um, the assumption is that you're on this master's course and you're an adult and you'll be treated as such. Um, that doesn't mean people aren't there to help, but you're going to have to advocate for yourself so people can then advocate for you. Um, three years is a long time, so if you start with these practices, it's easier to continue rather than getting to a crunch time and then your second year or your penultimate year and you're trying to do things that you should have already done. Um, and this all goes under the umbrella of having expe setting expectations with yourself and with other people. Um, so when you're talk having talks about training plan, um, if you want to speak to your um, training officer about, um, you know, could we have a um, well-being check-in or talk, have these conversations and you'll be surprised what how much support is out there. Um, there'll be at least one or two people that will be, for example, uh, mental health champions or advocates in your, in your department who you probably know already, but you may not know that that is their role. Um, so yeah, ask questions and hopefully the, these tips as well as everybody else else's can make up a smooth process and program. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you, Anthony. And I think all of you have come up with some um, really great top tips there, particularly around communication is really, really key. And you all mentioned that and having those open conversations and not being scared to have those open conversations and to ask questions because that you're there to learn. So asking questions is a good thing. And there'll be lots of support um, that will be talked about uh, to, in tomorrow's session as well. So thank you so much, the four of you. We're going to leave it there now. That was, you know, you gave us a wealth of experience there. And thank you so much for taking up your time. It was very, really inspirational, really, um, really honest, uh, but, um, productive uh, suggestions there so thank you so much um and we will now be going for a break um so if i just share my screen we'll come back at uh 10 past 11
um, and then we'll be joined by Namia. What I suggest for all of you, if you can, if it's um, safe for you to do so as such, to leave it um, open, is not to leave this meeting and then rejoin it just because it might clog up the, uh, might take a while for you to get back in just because there's so many of you, it can take a bit of time in the lobby. So if you can and you can keep your, your in a private place, then um, keep your, uh, keep logged in. And we'll see you at 10 past 11. Okay. And thank you again, Emily, Karindi, um, Ryan and Anthony. That was fantastic. So thank you.